Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Chatting with Creators. My name is Nate Bryant, currently subbing in for host Sapphire Toth as she works on some feature length projects this summer. Uh, a little bit about myself before we begin. I am a senior film scoring student at Berklee College of Music, and uh, I met Sapphire as a production assistant through one of the jobs I worked last summer and throughout the year. Uh, a little bit about CWC before we begin. Uh, the goal of this show is to contact and target young creators and young composers who may not necessarily have a lot of information or knowledge about the music industry or composition industry, uh, who would like to learn a little bit more past some of the basics that they might already know. Um, today, very exciting, our guest is Josue Greco. Please correct me if I pronounced your name incorrectly. No, that was perfect. All right, excellent. Um, and today I am asking him some questions about his latest project called Welcome to Wrexham, a show that is just released on FX and Hulu, uh, following two high profile actors, Rob McElhenney and Ryan Reynolds on their acquisition of the Wrexham football club in, I believe late 2020. It's a docuseries that follows that entire process. Um, so just to throw it right off, what was your initial reaction receiving this gig and how does it compare to other jobs and maybe your preferred style of composition? I noticed there's a lot of European folk elements in the score. Yeah, well, um, I was super, super excited to work on this because so the way this actually happened, the way this, this project came about was that I was actually able to write music before uh, receiving the cuts. Um, so, um, and that's, that was, that was great because I already had a little bit of an idea what I wanted to do. Um, and um, the idea there was to get a couple of traditional instruments and buy them and get them going. And so I got this banjo over here and this bouzouki and this mandolin and an accordion. And, um, I basically used... I basically used this this four traditional instrument to just kind of like start deciding what, what I was gonna do with it and like a, kind of like a little bit of a palette for yeah for for the moments that are not that bombastic, not the in-game stuff. Yeah, yeah. And for the in-game stuff, I I was also very excited about that because I have uh I have I had acquired a bunch of modular synthesizers at one point. Nice, nice. Um there's actually a lot. All around yeah, I can it. see some of the the wires in the background there. <laughs> yeah, there's quite quite a lot of yeah yeah wires going down. There's just a bunch of machines here. Oh yeah, yeah. Around. So I was just very pumped to put some of these babies to work, and and so the bombastic, the more like in game action cues, I I was just kind of like I was able to just go for it and run with it and write these very long cues with different elements in it and different moments and like rises and fall and bullet times and hits and stuff like that, that then uh, they would have been edited in by the editors later on. So it, as a composer, this is something that doesn't really happen often, writing off screen yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes it's great sometimes it's not that great i think for this specific scenario it was amazing because i had a little bit more of a free range to do whatever i wanted with it within reasons of, of mm -hmm. obviously i got some stuff rejected obviously right yeah yeah <laughs> uh, but at least i could take very big swings we had a long post-production time i mean i was contracted far ahead um that i could that I could just write a bunch of music and poten that potentially never gets used. Yeah, yeah. That's super fascinating. So would you say your own musical background, as you've already had a good amount of this music written, are you like more of a folk artist or what is your like predominant style of composition? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that I have picked one yet. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's just that it feels like every time I try to do something, I have a very ADHD type of artistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I can't really stick with something for too, too long. 
sometimes I just cycle through different genres and stuff. So like, I would, I might just play traditional instrument for four months and then drift into modular synthesizers and then go back into saxophones and brass. Yeah, yeah. And circle back to the strings whenever I got, whenever I'm tired of that. Um. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It's I, I'm not quite a one thing. Yeah. I yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah, I totally get that. I often go between like, I'm a big fan of uh, Westworld. So a lot of the music that I personally write is it cycles between like orchestral and like kind of folky and then weird, like futuristic synth production and modular synth production. So I think one of the greatest parts of being in this gig is that you can go between like a bunch of things and still have it work for the the final yeah. project. And yeah. I think I was listening to your score earlier today. Um, you've definitely combined all of those things to create a really interesting sound palette that I think is unique thank to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, it's also interesting because it seems the topic matter of the show seems very centralized around kind of Welsh pride and kind of the restoration of this old famous football club to something that they have since lost. And the music is very indicative of, you know, like Welsh folk or Scottish and Irish folk music. Was that something that you also kept in mind or did that kind of just happen to work out? Yeah, no, I, I, I researched, um, I researched um, Welsh traditional music a lot. And this is the thing, like, it, it's always like, it, it's always a very fine line when you don't know li li listening to traditional music of a specific place and being brought up in that specific place like yeah two, two completely different situations and like so, so when you're writing music that sounds and you want to incorporate some of those elements uh you have to be very careful that you don't fall into something that just sounds a little bit on the nose yeah i know what you're saying um and and it's quite easy to do so mm -hmm. so um for me it was like just kind of like trying to tiptoe around how do i play this traditional instrument in a way that feels natural because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. i think if you play if you if you if you actually buy one if you actually buy one of those and you tune them properly by properly, I mean with their um, standard tunings. Standard tunings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you try to play them, you literally put your hands on it and try to do the easiest thing possible. Yeah. You'll find out pretty quickly what what it is mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. it's supposed to sound. So, yes, I was listening to a lot of Welsh music, but at the same time, I was trying to make it my own and like try to pl play it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could do something just as easy as possible. Yeah. I think it's also important to remember that, and this is true for every folk music in the world. Mm -hmm. Folk musicians are almost never, maybe today, yes, but they're almost never professional instruments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Professional musicians. So some of these instruments are built in a way that you can play them with almost minimal effort. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So if, if you're a guitar player, that would be shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, if you're an accordion player, there will be buttons. So there is always like some degree of shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing, if you find yourself getting on a buzuki and you're doing weird stuff with your fingers, it's probably, you're not probably, you're you're not playing in the folk way, you know? Yeah, or I'm not yeah. You're probably not playing in the folk way. You can put a capo on and move around. Yeah, That's yeah. That's way more legit. It sounds way more legit, quote unquote. Interesting, yeah. Uh, but then if you, if you, when you're playing a guitar, the tuning of the guitar itself, the way our guitar today that we know, the six string one is built, it's built to play diet, uh, chrom chromatically. Mm -hmm. um, so it requires way more of like elasticity and knowledge and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. traditional instruments are usually diatonic, especially, yeah, yeah. especially in Europe. They're usually di diatonic, like made to play diatonic. I wish I could play something for you. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, it's like so if you have to put more than three fingers down, you're probably not doing it right. Yeah, yeah. That's very so intelligent. Me, yeah. 
it was like this quest of finding the right, the thing that sounds more legitimate, the thing that sounds easier to play, mm -hmm. and try to incorporate that into the the music for the score. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, 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 yes, I did listen to a lot of it, but at the same time, it just kind of came out naturally. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. I over COVID, one of my COVID projects, I bought a mandolin because I had yeah. been listening to a lot of like Chris Thiele and uh like yo-yo man is projects with bella fleck and i was like oh man i want to be able to learn how to play like those guys and at a certain point i was just like oh i can kind of just figure it out over time and figure yeah. out what sounds good um yeah. and a lot of times i think simpler is better you know like there's no need to especially in a score like this i don't think there was a need to go crazy with a lot of like super interest like super hard techniques um but yeah, that's super interesting. Um, that brings me to another thought that I had. You also included a lot of like brass and saxophone. Are you a saxophone player or a brass player? Yeah, yeah. I'm a saxophone player by trade. Uh, nice. I actually, um, I, I, so yeah, I started saxophone, traditional saxophone conservatory thing in uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and And that was... That was really hard uh, in terms of technical, you know, in terms of like developing your technical mm -hmm. stuff. And I ended up going to Berkeley. Um, when I went to Berkeley, I studied music music production engineering as a major. Nice. Yeah, nice. But I was also, you're a Berkeley kid too, you just mentioned. Yeah, it. yeah. And, uh, but I was also playing a bunch uh, like jazz, a bunch of jazz stuff mm -hmm. and following jazz classes and stuff like that so yeah i've always kept an eye on my saxophone and always and i always try to keep it going um and yeah there's a lot of saxophone in wrexham and i think that was a little bit that was one of the big swings for me i i wanted to try it at one point in a project and and i i, I just wrote a couple of tracks with this saxophone stuff and, and and it was really well well received so the the concept behind saxophones for this specific score is uh is that so if you listen to bon Iver, mm -hmm. bon Iver is actually one of the big biggest reference almost unexpectedly I, I wasn't really trying to do that but yeah yeah when you listen to bon Iver, bon Iver has a lot of saxophones uh but it's also very anthemic if it makes mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. Uh, his melodies are very easy to sing along with, and it's also diatonic music. Yes, yeah. Open yeah. tuning, uh, weird tunings, but they're always everything is super diatonic. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, how can I do that? At the same time, this is a movie about uh, soccer, so how do I make the saxophone sound like? an anthem mm -hmm. um so what i ended up doing was a little bit like stealing this idea from from the bon Iver productions mm -hmm. i used a pedal called the harmony singer oh uh, nice uh strymon strymon harmony singer oh okay yeah it's a it's a guitar pedal but you can mm -hmm. put a you can put a um, microphone on it yeah yeah so you i put the saxophone with the mic the microphone connected to the saxophone into the harmony singer and the harmony singer it's it's an harmonizer but it's a diatonic harmonizer oh okay i see so it has different modes but you can basically make it so the notes that are harmonized are in the like the back way the the four voices way yeah yeah so basically you send you uh send to the pedal whatever chord you're playing and it is able to detect the pedal is able to detect the root. Wow! So playing a D major, in this case, I was sending uh, a a proper like bass mm -hmm. from my AW into the pedal and playing back. So if you if you send a D and you play an F sharp, what you're gonna hear is gonna be D A F sharp D. Nice. So opened. Yeah. Open facing. Uh, and it's gonna harmonize it diatonically, but it it kind of almost always harmonizes them. 
harmonizes the notes that you're playing using the one, the four, and the five. So mm-hmm. only the major chords of the scale. Yeah. Which is also very folksy. Very, yeah, yeah. Kind of like almost major American. pentatonic. Yeah. Yeah. It's very like very specific major characteristic. Uh and on top of that, there is also a lot of like weird um artifacts because it's it's like a dark pedal and it works in real time and it's yeah. gone. The reverb on it. Uh, and all these imperfections. Also, sometimes the tuning doesn't. It just kind of like it takes a little bit to snap back mm-hmm. to the correct mm-hmm. voicing. And and I felt like this was the most human uh, dimension to 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 like an harmonizer. Almost. Yeah, yeah. So when you go to the stadium, there's a bunch of people singing. Uh, so I kind of wanted the saxophone to be like the Wuzela. Or oh this. yeah, yeah. And this is all very philosophical, but it kind uh-huh, of uh-huh. comes out uh, like a, just this this very loud horn mm-hmm. that blasts this thing, and then it turns into a choir of saxophones. Nice, yeah. So the saxophones that play along with it are not real; they're like yeah, fake. yeah. And you want to hear that they're fake because that's interesting. The allure. Yeah. That's super cool. I wish I had that pedal when I was doing figured bass classes. I could have just like. Cool, here we go. I'll just play it on the pedal. I'll do it for me. That's awesome. Um, I think it's really cool as well, like taking really weird abstract ideas like a Vuvuzela and trying to communicate that through instruments and manipulating the tone and the sound and some of the tunings to make it sound like something that is less real, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I I love that idea so much. This is also, this is the thing too that I'm realizing um, as years go by. Uh, how do I explain this? Like, it's okay to have weird sounds. It's totally legit. Just don't hide them. Actually yeah. boost them up in the mix. Mm-hmm. The louder an ID, the louder a weird thing is going to be, the higher the chances of, of success. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think. Just kind of own it. Like, yeah. own your face, you know? Yeah. I totally agree. Because then, like, who else is doing that, you know? Everybody can write, like, a string section, but who else can put a saxophone through a Bach harmonizer and, like, detune it to make it sound like a vuz? Like, it's... Yeah. I love the idea of just owning the weird stuff, yeah. Yeah, owning the weird stuff. And sometimes, uh, tagging along on that uh, conversation, I think even just owning the uh, the 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 nuances of it like i think for a really long time in film scoring there was a time where we were obsessed with like everything being so perfect Mm -hmm. the string gonna sound perfect every everything's gonna sound perfect and i think i went through a phase where that was important for me as well but i came to the realization that the imperfection is what makes it if what it's what makes the music relatable Mm -hmm. and and so if this is a little bit of an extreme thing but if everything sounds bad then it's gonna start sounding very good yeah yeah (laughs) i know what you mean (laughs) uh but if if only few things sounds good and everything else sounds very good Mm -hmm. sorry the opposite if 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 a cello line is perfectly in tune yeah Everything else sounds not very good. Mm-hmm. It's You're not gonna notice. Not coherent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the brain, the brain recognizes that mm-hmm. and, and registers it as something is wrong. Yeah, but if yeah. Everything is bad. Everything is great. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really insightful point of view. I think. Um, kind of continuing off of that, um, what would you say the most challenging part was about composing this music and how long did it take you to kind of realize that this aspect of like bringing up the strange sounds and strange ideas in the mix to come? Yeah, well, these two things actually go, uh, they're, they're, kind, they're kind of like complementary in the mm-hmm. sense that um, for some time when I was writing uh, for Welcome to Wrexham, I was trying to get, I, I already wanted, I wanted to start recording Real Instrument immediately mm-hmm. uh, because 
I was trying to temp music. Uh, I was trying to write actually using um, virtual instruments. Yeah. Uh, inspired uh, uh, libraries that sounded okay in the mm -hmm. end. Like I had this fiddle library, I had this buzuki library, mandolin library, and all the stuff, and 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 that was really really difficult. It was actually it was so hard it, because in my mind I thought there's no way I can just buy a bunch of instruments and get them to play. Yeah, yeah. As good as this, um, and, and I was actually making the mistake that we were just talking about. I was trying to make these libraries sound very good, and the mm -hmm. library are very well recorded by super incredible amazing musicians and and it almost adds to the weirdness when you try to play them back on your keyboard interesting yeah not to mention that there's some technical aspect to it like whatever happens on a keyboard it's never gonna happen on a, on a mandolin or something like that yeah 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 so so that was uh i was just for a little bit i was like just kind of like stranded and like drifting mm -hmm um in the oblivion but then ultimately i just decided to to pull the trigger on some of these stuff and and i started recording it there it, obviously even that was a little challenging because i'm not a guitar player whatsoever mm -hmm. so there were a lot of like technical things that i knew but i never i never actually I never actually had the time to experiment myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Instead of instruments like tube microphones are good for certain things, but they're not very good on a banjo. Uh, I see. Yeah. Key, or even stuff like tuning. Like the banjo is not really supposed to be in tune. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know that. Yeah. Because I yeah. was trying to tune it perfectly and then it sounded terrible. Um, how to properly tune a double string instrument and make sure yeah. that it's up on top and like uh close micing far micing uh room mics yes mm. no what to do there's a lot of like technical things yeah yeah absolutely but then ultimately i set up my recording space in a way that i didn't really have to think about that stuff mm -hmm. too much once they're set up i have a pair of uh neumann up in the sky right there up in oh nice feeling and then then I have this uh, two microphones. Oh, nice! Uh, yeah, on one of these thingies, so that I can bring it forward and backwards. Mm -hmm. and so, setting that, getting it all set up, helped overcoming all these creative um, mm -hmm. roadblocks. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I can imagine the difficulty in trying to figure out like which recording techniques are best for these instruments that aren't typically recorded in a studio setting. Yeah, and especially do trying to do that with with efficiency in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, I'm not gonna be able to like I gotta do it in. Yeah, you can't spend like a month trying yeah. to figure out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. That's super cool. Um, it's funny you say about the the tuning the double stringed instruments. I don't know if this is technically correct, but I had somebody who played mandolin tell me once that. When you tune the strings, you tune the octave string like ever so slightly out of tune so yeah. that you can hear that it is doubled instead of being yeah. so perfect that it's like yeah. irrecognizable. Yeah, uh, yeah. I yeah. was just thought that was fascinating. That's very true. That's very true. And funny enough, the more you do that, the more you get into like deep purple, like LSD music. Yeah, yeah. The less, so the more the two strings are perfectly in tune the more library stock library mm -hmm. sound yeah so it's always like in between lsd or contact <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious uh, um and you mentioned that you didn't have a lot of time to kind of dedicate to figuring out like each different recording technique uh what was the workflow like and how much time did they give you to to completely finish the music for the show yeah, so uh, preliminary scoring, what I call preliminary scoring, so the stage in which I write these very long cues, like mm -hmm. five on the cues, that was about, I want to say four months. Okay. So I really, I really had my time with nice. that. And, mm -hmm. But then the picture locks started coming in. Uh, 
I want to say I maybe had realistically three days per episode. Okay, interesting. And that's uh, actually not uncommon for TV. Yeah. yeah. All the composers or um, aspiring composers for TV, I think, um, the, yeah, the, that's usually the workaround. Maybe it's like five days. Mm -hmm. And uh, and unfortunately, I have to say it's five days from you receiving the picture lock at like 5 p.m. to you delivering the stamps. Yeah. So within those five days or whatever, three days, five days, you have to write, record, produce, mix, mm -hmm. master, whatever you have to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, stem it out, <clears throat> delivering it, QC, and, and they go to the stage. Gotcha. So, it, it, it's a muscle ultimately it's uh i know it, it might sound crazy at first and i thought that was crazy too mm -hmm, when i mm -hmm. when i first started writing for tv but ultimately that's 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 like you know it's it's a muscle it's like going to the gym you just do it and you just get you, better over time you just get better yeah 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 um and also like the deadline doesn't move that's the deadline so yeah, yeah. you're gonna do it you have the yeah it's either you do it or you don't you know <laughs> you do or you don't and you, yeah. you, you can find a way and i think and I think it's totally okay if uh, you don't do all those tasks yourself, you know. Uh, yeah. If you yeah. Team, like, if you if you can whatever if you if you have a team if you can afford to do it, you have time to write, and then you have a person who records all the stuff. Yeah. And then you have an engineer that mixes it all. Uh, some composers do it like that. Uh, I think it's definitely possible, but there's just a lot of things that come into play and budget is one of them. Yeah. yeah. Time is also one of, one of the mm -hmm. things. So. Um, did you, not only for this project, but also for other projects, do you normally prefer to be your own mix master recording engineer, or do you prefer to compose and then send it off to someone else or does it depend? Um, yeah. I mean, so far I've always done everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, myself, I am open. I'm open to the idea of having uh, third-party mixers. Yeah, I think it would give me peace of mind, and um, and and, and yeah, I'm totally open to it. In, yeah, yeah. In the future, but so far, I just had to do everything. It, sometimes, sometimes it's a little easier also to do everything by yourself. Yeah, from like the needy greedy like technical point of view, you open your session you have all your things and then mm -hmm. you can just select what you want you export yeah yeah like an amount of you know what you want you know what you need to do and you don't have to spend time explaining to someone else yeah yeah, yeah. but uh, at the same time if uh if orchestra recordings is in the it's in the cards or third-party recordings or other musicians or the drummer mm -hmm. like that then it makes more sense to have a mixing engineer. And I'm assuming that person would also be the person who is in charge of, of putting everything together, like assets management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then it's a great workflow. And that also gives you more freedom to work on other project, work on your music. You know, if you just concentrate on writing and then you hit command S or whatever, command yeah. C, and then the, your mixing engineer has everything you, you can concentrate on creative tasks yeah yeah i know i've talked to some colleagues and some other established composers through the cwc podcast and it seems like there's a mix of people wanting really to have a lot of control over their music or like you said have enough time to write fully and just expend all their creative energy on the composition process rather than yeah. all the technical stuff yeah. Um that's definitely interesting. What would I'm you not, say? Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say I'm not pressure, I'm not precious about me wanting I don't have I don't have like mixing opinions or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. If there is a third party mixer, I trust him. I, I of course I listen to stuff, but yeah, yeah. 99 percent of the times the mixers around that are out there are amazing and way much better than me. Yeah, uh, yeah. It just it just never quite happened that um that I hired a mixer, but I'm totally open to it. Uh, so if you, if there is any mixer listening, <laughs> send me your stuff. Yeah, there you go. Um, what was your like favorite part in 
the whole post-production process for Wrexham? Was there something that was super exciting to work on or something that was really, really fun? Um, let's see. Post-production process, something that was really fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is this is funny. This is fun actually. Uh there were a couple of like UK drill electronic music tracks that I had to write. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a big fan of electronic music in general and like rap and hip hop and trap. So it was fun for me to get away from the traditional DAWs and yeah. Ableton and do stuff on Ableton. Which actually I'd like to encourage in you know, in our field, I think Ableton is kind of like frowned upon. Yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't have all the feature, the media, the stuff, blah blah blah. Who cares? The invest some time in Ableton. I think it's important to use it as an instrument. Mm-hmm. Or then uh, I don't know if you had the chance to mess around with it very but lightly, but it, I know some people that are they've taken Ableton classes and they learned how to use it and they like that's the only thing they use now they swear by it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and with a little bit more features dedicated to video, I would probably just use that. Nice. My main dog. Interesting. It, it's such a creative. Again, from a creative point of view, it's 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 his own instrument. And you'd be shocked of, of how fast you're going to be if you use it for like two weeks. Interesting. Um, I'm, as a matter of fact, I think I'm much faster in Ableton than anything else. Mm. And it's not be, it's not a feature thing. It's just that you can just drag and drop stuff, and it sounds great. And then you yeah, and it's done. Nice. So so yeah, working on Ableton is always fun, and I always cherish cherish the the opportunity to interesting that's cool yeah i think i definitely need to get into the whole ableton train i've heard way too many people talk about how great it is so it's about time you know um just i think we have time for a couple more questions but i did want to ask one kind of not serious question so ryan reynolds and rob McElhenney are primarily comedic actors and they're making this documentary about something that they did during COVID. And I know that the majority of the show is meant to kind of be a sports docuseries and go over like real life events that are necessarily more serious and less comedic in nature. Um, But I do think that there are parts of the show which are fairly funny and it has its moments, you know, was there any time when watching clips or watching cues where you were like, this is a funny scene. So I kind of have to make the music revolve around that nature more than the other themes. All the time. Really? Every okay. Time, I, I think it's pretty obvious when um, a comedic scene comes your way, mm-hmm. uh, especially with those two guys talking when they're together. Yeah. They're really funny. So many times, yeah, I did have to write some comedy cues that didn't make it into the album, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I actually have a quite a large repository of <laughs> cues with like punches and like um, buttons or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually have a comedy drum set that is not in here anymore uh-huh. because I dismantled it, but uh, I recorded like a series of uh, pieces using that drum set and i also made a contact library out of those percussion oh nice yeah um i have a box full of percussion that you can see and Mm -hmm. maybe it's good that you can see it because it's a mess yeah Uh, let's get any sort of things so 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 yeah definitely comedic moments tons of it and uh yeah there is uh, oftentimes you are as a composer, you are required to, you're not required, but like your instinct drives you towards start and stopping the music and adding percussion and like doing, doing all those dynamic moves that mm-hmm. uh, help the comedy, you know, work. A yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And was timing like a big part of that as well? Did you have to kind of manipulate where it started, where it ended, like weird time signature changes, stuff like that, tempo changes? Uh, yeah, you know, this is 
it's funny that you that we're talking about this because I I'm noticing that there's a lot of um the big bigger conversation around time changes and signature change I see it more mm-hmm. often but I don't re- I don't like to mess with my tempo that much yeah I agree with that yeah it's just uh it's just so hard for me and I when I see there's a lot of I haven't done that much animation actually but most of the composers that do animation they 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 swear by their their tempo track mm-hmm. they're always mm-hmm. like shifting their their actual bpm up and down and and I'm sure I'm sure they're right. It just I have never personally encountered uh, a situation where I had to do that very often. Yeah. And yeah. If, sometimes I get tempt music, and if the temp music has a bunch of tempo changes, I just don't listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> you can map it out. You just put markers mm-hmm. where you want your in and out, mm-hmm. and then you just kind of like average the tempo. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, so that you can just kind of like get it in the ballpark. Yeah, that's what you're saying. So yeah, signature change, yes, ish. Tempo change, I really try to avoid it as much. Interesting. As well. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know in past projects that I've worked on, like I've done it just because that's what the situation called for. But I always yeah. have like something inside me dies when the tempo goes from like here to here, and then like it looks all over the place, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's also like I'm sure it. It sounds. It sounds great. Mm-hmm. I I get anxiety when I see it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, okay, I think we are just about running out of time. Uh, thank you for coming and talking today. That was super interesting. Thank you so Very much. insightful. Yeah, of course. Um, do you want to tell the audience where they can find not only this score but some of your other scores and maybe other compositional works? Sure. Yeah, you can find me on Spotify. Uh, Apple Music and all the other the major music websites. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, as with my name, you type in Josue Greco. That's me. Uh, there's only one of them, and it's got this picture, the picture of my face. And also, you can find me on Instagram uh, at sounds like Josue, and on TikTok, same handle, and also on YouTube, same handle. Nice, awesome. Well, again, thank you for coming on the show today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you so much for having me. Bye.